This week from the Global Lane, North Korea launches another ballistic missile. We'll tell you which parts of the United States are now under threat. Where in the world? A new crackdown against Christians and those serving in China. We'll talk to a missionary who was forced out. We'll set it straight on how proposed tax changes could harm some American college students. And what do Americans think about the North Korea missile threat? Do they think about it at all? Meng Fei Lee asked the man on the street. And I'll drive it home with a commentary on the holiday season. Do you wish people happy holidays or Merry Christmas? And it's all here right now from the Global Lane. North Korea has test launched another ballistic missile, the first since September. The Pentagon said the missile went higher and farther than any North Korean missile tested to date. Chinese warned North Korea to stop activities that heighten tensions in that region. And in Hawaii, officials conducted the first civil defense drill since the Cold War, testing nuclear attack warning systems. A possibility of attack today is very remote, um, but we do believe that it's important that we be proactive. Now let's listen to the reaction of President Trump and Defense Secretary Mattis at the White House less than three hours after the North Koreans launched that missile. A missile was launched a little while ago from North Korea. I will only tell you that we will take care of it. We have General Mattis in the room with us, and uh, we've had a long discussion on it. It is a situation that we will handle. It went higher, frankly, than any previous shot they've taken. It's a research and development effort on their part to continue building ballistic missiles that could threaten uh, everywhere in the world, basically. Joining us now to discuss this development is CBN News national security correspondent Eric Rosales from Washington. Eric, what can you tell us about this one? It seemed that Mattis was a little more concerned this time. Oh, he certainly was concerned. You know, he actually said that this was a uh, major threat, not only a major advancement for North Korea, but also a major threat not only to the United States, but the entire region in the Korean Peninsula and the world, for that fact, because, uh, you know, having North Korea as a, uh, as a, uh, being able to do these ICBM missiles and be able to launch these things, this is, uh, this is very dangerous. This is a, we're talking about a madman there, over there. Uh, you know, this missile went 2,800 miles into the air. That's 10 times higher than the International Space Station, and it lasted for about uh, 45 to 50 minutes in the air. So, uh, you know, if all they needed to do was just change the tra trajectory, and it could have hit right here in uh, Washington, D.C., on the east coast of the uh, continental U.S. Now, I know when the Pentagon announced that you rushed right over there, what did they say right. about the reason that Kim Jong-un launched the missile this time? Well, they're, uh, they're saying that it actually has to do with just research, you know, research and development. With every single missile launch, he is learning more about, uh, about missiles and things like that. As of right now, it takes uh, three stages for a missile launch. Uh, you, have, uh, you have the initial booster, the takeoff, and then you have the mid-flight, and then you have the re-entry. And he seemed to be able to master the, uh, the booster and the mid-flight, and now he's working on the re-entry. You know, part of the missile actually did disintegrate as it hit the atmosphere back into the uh, back into the Earth's atmosphere, and that is good news for the United States. But all experts say that it's only a matter of time before he's able to uh, get that trajectory just right to be able to come down and and make it uh, through the Earth's atmosphere and bring this uh, ICBM possibly to the United States. So testing, perfecting, testing it some is more. It's all about perfection, exactly. And, and I understand he wanted to send a message to China because China's cracking down now and endorsing and following the uh, sanctions. And after the meeting with President Trump, the Chinese didn't seem too happy about it. Uh, no, basically Chinese saying he's causing the, the whole Korean Peninsula to be unstable. Um, well, the whole thing about this, Gary, is it's, it's interesting. You know, he has to be getting this technology from somewhere. No way can he actually be... Uh, be doing this from uh, uh, from a country, a rogue, a country that is starving as much as it is. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that he's taking as much money as he can away from his people, from the mouths of his people, and and putting it towards this missile defense. Uh, uh, program, but at the same time, he has to be getting the technology help either from Iran or from Russia or even from China, maybe underground type of thing. 
Yeah, through the black market, maybe. Uh, exactly. Now, while Mattis and the president seem quite concerned, Eric, uh, nothing they've done so far has seemed to stop Kim Jong-un from testing. Why is that? Well, I tell you what, it's like, you know, um, this we're not dealing with a, with a sane man. You know, when you think about all the other uh, leaders in the world that we've had uh, missile defense uh, uh, talks with and things like that, we're dealing with people who are worried about their own people and protecting their own country. This is a guy who is willing to just starve his own people, put his own people in, in prison for, for, for even in believing in the name of Jesus and believing in, in the name of God. Um, you know, he, he would rather have them sit and starve and die. And I, I just can't believe that these people are so brainwashed that they are not going to have some sort of a coup or rise up and take him out of power. But uh, as he heard from the president, we are ready. We do have plans in the works to take him out. Well, I think the people don't uh, respond otherwise is because they risk death and imprisonment. And we saw them sure. applauding uh, this missile launch in Pyongyang. Uh, but I think they do that because they're worried about their own safety. So so what now, Eric? I, I know that uh, we we had a couple members of the Senate were saying, boy, uh, I think it was Lindsey Graham, actually. Lindsey Graham yeah, was who, actually who saying said, that we're going to go to war. Yeah, yeah if, it, if it's a good something chance. doesn't change. So yeah, what might we chance. do in response? Well, as as we know, we're still taking the diplomatic efforts. Uh, you know, I, I did speak to members of the Pentagon. They tell me that that uh, they do not want to go to war, but uh, they are willing to go to war at a moment's notice, and they are ready to fight tonight. That's what they keep saying. But uh, you know, I tell you what, Lindsey Graham, he uh, he kind of spelled it out there that that we cannot let this guy continue. Uh, with having missile abilities and nuclear missile abilities and be able to put the, th the threat on the United States and continue with his leadership. We're going to have to either, you know, the United Nations, the United uh, Nations Security Council, they're meeting, they're having an emergency meeting trying to figure out what exactly is going to be the next step because sanctions aren't working. You know, he's, uh, we're already cutting him off uh, from, from many of the imports that are coming into the country. Uh, from sources there, I'm hearing that gas lines are long, people are running out of gas, people are uh, starving to death. Uh, but at the same time, he's not stopping this, uh, this ballistic missile program of his. And uh, it's going to come to the point where we're going to have to step up. And I possibly uh, believe with uh, fair with Lindsey Graham that we're going to have to do something. Well, I'm sure you'll keep us on top of it. And uh, Eric, you got it, Gary. a lot to pray about, isn't there? Yes, certainly a lot yeah. to pray about in the, in the coming days. Yes, okay. in the coming months. Thanks for your insights. Thank you, sir. During his recent Asia trip, President Trump seemed to get along well with Chinese President Xi Jinping. Mr. Trump asked Xi to put more pressure on North Korea to end its ballistic missile program. And one issue that wasn't discussed, at least publicly, was China's apparent crackdown on people of faith. In one Chinese province, Christians are being forced to replace religious posters with images of President Xi. And now an American missionary says that he's been denied entrance to China for the first time in 31 years. Well, Patrick Klein is with Vision Beyond Borders. He joins us now from Hong Kong. Patrick, we remember back in 2008 during the Beijing Olympics, you were prevented from bringing Bibles into China, but you were still allowed to enter the country at that time. Tell us what happened this time. Well, I was actually going across the border last Saturday. I had 22 pastor study Bibles in Chinese. And uh, when I got up to the counter, the lady saw that I had made many trips into China. And I, it's never been a problem before, but she saw I had many chops in my passport. And so she looked down and she saw I had a suitcase next to me. And so she called over the leaders I was then taken to an interrogation room and held for two and a half hours. I was questioned why I was bringing Bibles into China. I said I brought Bibles to uh, help the people that they'd asked, pastors had asked for Bibles 20 years ago. And I just came to bring Bibles. Um, they looked through the Bibles. They said the paper quality was not good enough. And they actually held me for two and a half hours. I had, at one point, I had eight military police surrounding me to keep me from running away, I guess. Um, but just for bringing Bibles, 22 Bibles in the country, 
and then my visa was canceled and the Bibles were confiscated. I guess you need better paper there, uh, <laughs> Bibles with better paper, Patrick. Sure. That's a good one. I haven't heard that one before. Uh, did, you, did you say to them, uh, I thought you had religious freedom in China? What did they say? I did say that, and they said, well, you're not allowed to bring Bibles into China. I said, where is it written? There's nothing saying that I can't bring them in. It doesn't say that in customs. Um, I said, it says I can't bring ammunition and other things, drugs in, but it doesn't say I can't bring Bibles. And they said, well, you ought to know better than this. You are not allowed back in China. We're canceling your visa. Well, I know you're not alone. I understand the same thing has happened to other Christian workers. Tell us what's going on. Well, since January 1, 2017, we've had over 20 couriers actually stopped at the border and their visas have been canceled. Some of them, Gary, it's a first trip into China. And I actually heard about one man, American man, that was denied entrance last week. Also, he only had four Bibles. And so we're seeing a crackdown. It's like they don't want Bibles brought in from the outside. I asked him, I said, if you don't allow Bibles, where do people get Bibles? They said, well, you can go to the bookstore and you can buy them. I said, I've been to the bookstores. I have not seen Bibles available. And they said, well, you're just not looking in the right places. And anytime I went to ask questions, they'd say, be quiet, be quiet, don't ask questions. And it was kind of interesting because they were all kind of really puffed up around me. But when they were off by themselves, they're all laughing and joking about it. So it's just, it seems like a real crackdown and and just real oppression of Christians and trying to keep Bibles from coming into China. So you think it is part of a bigger crackdown against evangelism, missionary work in China. What is happening to others inside China and what do you expect in the future? Well, we've heard that any meetings with more than 10 people have to be approved by the government. Um, we've even heard from some of our contacts inside that they have been threatened by the police that if they receive Bibles from foreigners, they will have big trouble from the government. So we're seeing uh, it's really clamping down on the inside as well. They're trying to keep Bibles from, com from coming in from the outside, but also clamping down on the inside. I think we're going to see the church have to go back underground in China, and I think it's going to get really worse. Patrick, you say you've never experienced this in more than 30 years of traveling into China. Why now? I think with this new leader, and he really looks up to Mao, Chairman Mao, and I think it's a step backwards for China. I think he's looking at really pressing in with Marxism and enforcing this control over people. And I think he, he feels threatened by the church because we know there's many more Christians than there are Communist Party members. And maybe he's afraid that the Christians are going to overthrow the government, which we know that's not the intention of Christians. We just want to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and, and serve God with all of our hearts. We're not trying to overthrow governments. We, a lot of times, people become, they become really good citizens when they become Christians, and so, and they have compassion. They want to help people, and it seems sometimes that these governments feel threatened because Christians start doing the work that the government should be doing. I, I know the Christians also <laughs> pray for their government and their leaders. So, uh, what should our viewers do? <laughs> we ask that people really pray for China. Please pray for China. Take it seriously, because I think this could be a real repressive time for the church to have to really go underground. I mean, we've always seen God through persecution in a lot of places. The church grows even more, but we need people to really pray, and we need people to come help and carry Bibles. If people would help us get more Bibles into China and just keep going in, and, and even if they, they get kicked out, at least people can see what's going on, and the Chinese government sees that the Christians in America are, are determined to help our Christian brothers and sisters in China. And Patrick, I, I can't let you go without asking you about another country, Myanmar, Burma. And I know you've traveled there a lot. I even joined you once on a visit there. What do you make of the Pope's visit there? That's historic. That Burma is going in a good direction. I think they're really changing. They're really opening up more and more. And I think we need to really be praying for them. I'm actually headed there about in about a week. And we're going to have Christmas for about 400 orphans there in Burma. That's great. And I, I know the Pope wants to show support and encouragement for Christians and the tiny Catholic community there. What about other Christians other than Catholics? How do they view the Pope's visit? Is it, is it good for Burma, do they think? I think it's good for Burma because it gives more exposure to what's going on in Burma and even what's happened in the past with Christians being oppressed by the Burmese military. I think it's good. I think it'll, it'll put more spotlight on what's going on in the country of Burma and help the Christians in the long run. And, and Pope Francis spoke out against the mistreatment of Rohingya ethnics, more than 600,000 have fled uh, Burma because of government-backed uh, violence there, and now they're refugees in Bangladesh. What can you tell us from your experience? Will 
this help or harm the Rohingya, him, him speaking out about it? I think it will help them. Um, but I'm, I kind of have mixed emotions. You know, there's some things that the Rohingyas have done to kind of provoke this whole thing with the Buddhists. And, and so we need to really be praying that God gives wisdom to the leaders how to walk through this thing. And, and you know, we want to make sure that, it, that the truth is known so people can make right decisions. A provision in the tax bill approved by the House of Representatives is causing some concern at U.S. colleges and universities. It's the repeal of a section of the current tax code, which exempts graduate students from paying federal income tax on tuition costs waived by their schools. Now, some people claim if enacted into law, the change would possibly prove devastating to graduate research and American competitiveness around the world. And here with more is Dr. Joseph Cordes, He's associate director of the Trachtenberg School and professor of economics at George Washington University. Dr. Cordes, please explain to us how does the current law benefit graduate students and our country? Well, uh, the current law benefits graduate students by uh, essentially not subjecting to tax uh, the portion of their graduate awards that uh, typically uh, either waives or covers uh, tuition expenses. Um, the way many people believe it benefits the country is that obviously uh, this is kind of a form of uh, uh, federal subsidy to graduate education uh, in the United States, uh, which promotes uh, research, development, uh, development of human capital, because graduate students very often go on to become the next generation of teachers, uh, uh, pastors, uh, and, uh, you know, the like. So, well, what effect then would, would the proposed change have on the students and research and American competitiveness? How it will affect the students will really depend on how the universities and colleges react to the uh, proposed taxation uh, of tuition waivers. Uh, basically, all of the stories that people have seen in the press, I think, uh, assume that, in fact, the graduate students will have to bear the burden of the tax, which is certainly one scenario. And uh, if that were to come to pass, I think what we would see uh, is certainly uh, uh, many fewer graduate students in, in, in you know, uh, universities and colleges uh, throughout the U.S. It's possible, and I think it's quite likely, that universities who, after all, compete for graduate students will react to this provision if it's enacted by increasing the cash portion of the graduate awards. Now, that's good news for the graduate students because it will lessen the tax burden on them. It's not good news for the universities because it will increase the cost of graduate education. And that will probably lead to some decrease in graduate education throughout the United States. Uh, this is such a significant change infecting so many uh, potential students and universities that it's a little too early to sort of figure out what the magnitude of it would be. But I think it would be significant. Well, well I know it isn't in this, the uh, Senate bill that is under debate right now, is it? Uh, I think it was just the House that That's made correct. that change. So uh, what was the reasoning there from the House of Representatives? You've been following this stuff for many years. Was it well thought out? Doesn't sound like it. I would have to say the, the main reasoning, well, was essentially to come up with what here in D.C. we call pay-fors for the portions of the tax bill that reduce taxes elsewhere. Um, there isn't a particularly strong policy rationale for doing this, uh, since, after all, we've treated this component of graduate uh, uh, support as non-taxable for, you know, at least 50, 60 years, and there's never been any serious discussion of changing that. So I think the main rationale here, pure and simple, was to come up with uh, additional revenue that then could be used to finance tax cuts elsewhere. President Trump, like Ronald Reagan, has moved early on in his presidency to push for tax reform. How does this effort compare to the tax cuts Ronald Reagan enacted 36 years ago? I'm sure you remember that well. I not only remember it well, I was privileged to be able to work on the tax reform project in the Reagan Treasury. The answer I'm giving my friends and colleagues these days is, is I paraphrase uh, Senator Lloyd Benson in the following way. Uh, 
I know tax reform. I worked on tax reform. The Trump proposal is not tax reform. Okay. Well, Dr. Joseph Cordes, we thank you for providing your insights today. Thanks for being with All us. All right. Thanks. Pleasure talking with you. If you live in Hawaii or Alaska, maybe even the West Coast of the United States, you may be concerned about North Korean missiles. But it's not just the western U.S. that is in range. Folks at the Pentagon now say if Kim Jong-un had his military adjust the trajectory of the latest missile, it could have hit anywhere in the United States. Yes, that means New York, Maine, Florida. So what do Americans think? Does the missile threat even cross their minds? Our man Meng Fei Lee took to the streets to find out. Recently, North Korea launched another missile attack. And then, so basically, the missile can reach anywhere in the States. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, it's concerning, yeah, for sure. And what do you think our president should do? Uh, hopefully not escalate to a war. Whatever it takes not to, you know, actually go into a war, yeah. Well, it's scary, certainly. However, it would seem that if we... Um, just say we're going to attack that given the political situation that um, that it might start a war. So I would think at this, pl at this point <clears throat> diplomacy might be the best thing. So it hasn't seemed to work yet. And so what do you think our President Donald Trump should do at this moment? I think he should probably scale back on the saber rattling and let the um, diplomats try to get in. He does seem to have a good um, he does seem to have good instincts when he's talking about trying to bring the Chinese in. So, um, but whether that or not that's going to happen, one can never tell. Well, the way I look at it is I'm a believer in Jesus, so I give it all to Jesus. I turn it over to him. I talk to him about it because he's ultimately in control of everything. So, um, I... That's how I deal with it. I give it to the Lord. I think that we have a hothead in, the, in our White House right now, so I think there's going to be a lot of talk. Um, I think, but hopefully we have the people behind him that are actually going to guide him in the right way. And hopefully um, Jesus will help guide us in the right way. Amen. And yeah. what do you think our president should do? I think he should stop tweeting. And I think he should make um, better choices and, and have people help him think better in a more diplomatic way than um, from being a hothead, like he's on the playground. I think it's very scary, and I wonder what the future will hold. And I'm afraid he's just going to say something and have them just try and just set one off. And... Probably be smart. Oh, what do you mean by that? That he does the right thing to protect the Americans. Why are so many Americans afraid of wishing one another Merry Christmas during this time of year? I guess as secularism grows in our society, it's just not politically correct, is it? How many times do you go Christmas shopping and a sales clerk completes a transaction with Happy Holidays? They just can't bring themselves to say Merry Christmas. I wonder if it's their choice or do their employers limit their free speech rights? So why do businesses fear offending people by saying two simple words Merry Christmas. Close to 70% of Americans are Christian. Only about 2% are Jewish, 1% Buddhist, 1% Hindu, 1% are Muslim. Most people know Christians celebrate their Savior's birth this time of year. And it isn't just businesses. Some local governments also appear fearful of Christmas. The Washington, D.C. Metro has banned Catholics from displaying this ad on buses this year. It doesn't say Merry Christmas, but I guess D.C. Metro finds wise men and shepherds offensive. But back to the P.C. Happy Holidays talk. Most is coming from big retailers. Take a look at these select website ads. This one advertises gifts of the season and tells online shoppers to make their selections from the holiday gift guide. There's no mention of Christmas gifts or the Christmas gift guide. This ad from The Gap talks about Mama's first holiday season instead of Mama's first Christmas. And Barnes & Noble wants you to make this holiday one for the books. I can't help but wonder which holiday we Americans celebrate many of them. I guess because the ad features evergreen tree branches, it could be any winter holiday. Let's see, maybe it's Martin Luther King's birthday, um, President's Day or Valentine's Day. 
You see, we can honor a civil rights leader and say his name for his birthday, Lincoln and Washington, the presidents for theirs, but, but no, we can't say Christmas to honor Christ on his birthday. That might offend the minority in this country who don't celebrate the day. Christians, how many times have you wished Jewish Americans happy Hanukkah? If you're like me, you know they celebrate it, and you take no offense at it. But some retailers are becoming a little bit more Christmas friendly this year. Home Depot mentions artificial Christmas trees in this ad. But holiday, not Christmas inflatables. So I guess Santa visits on holiday eve, not Christmas eve, right? Well, contrary to what some people may believe, President Obama did wish Americans a Merry Christmas. Watch his final Christmas greeting from the White House one year ago. Tomorrow, for the final time as the first family, we will join our fellow Christians around the world to rejoice in the birth of our Savior. And as we retell his story from that holy night, we'll also remember his eternal message, one of boundless love, compassion, and hope. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everybody. And this year at the National Christmas Tree Lighting Ceremony, President Trump showed he wasn't going to be politically well, correct for this, his first Christmas at the White House. The Christmas story begins 2,000 years ago with a mother, a father, their baby son, and the most extraordinary gift of all, the gift of God's love for all of humanity. Whatever our beliefs, we know that the birth of Jesus Christ and the story of this incredible life forever change the course of human history. Each and every year at Christmas time, we recognize that the real spirit of Christmas is not what we have. It's about who we are. Each one of us is a child of God. That is the true source of joy this time of the year. That is what makes every Christmas Mary. And now, as the President of the United States, it's my tremendous honor to finally wish America and the world a very Merry Christmas. And just take a look at how the White House was decorated this year. First Lady Melania Trump gave reporters a tour this week, and I must say it was spectacular. She met with some school children as they crafted some cards for members of the military. And then there's this official White House Christmas card signed by the Trumps. Yes, a Christmas card wishing recipients a Merry Christmas. So thank you, Mr. President and Mrs. Trump, for going against the grain this year, actually celebrating Christmas instead of the holidays at the White House. After all, Christ is the reason for the season. He's why we celebrate. So I hope you'll join me and millions of other Americans as we do our Christmas shopping, put up Christmas trees, hang Christmas lights, and celebrate this Christmas season in wishing family, friends, and others a very Merry Christmas. Have no fear. A child is born. He's called Emmanuel, God with us, the Savior of the world. Well, that's it from the Global Lane. Catch us on Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, and Twitter. And until next time, be blessed.